Hi, this is Oryu Dulevich, Chief Product Officer at Material Zone, and you're listening to Experiencing Data with Brian T. O'Neill. You're now Experiencing Data with Brian O'Neill. Experiencing Data explores how product managers, analytics leaders, data scientists, and executives are looking at design and user experience as a way to make their custom enterprise data products and analytics applications more useful, usable, and valuable. And now, here's your host, the founder and principal of Designing for Analytics, Brian O'Neill. Welcome back to Experiencing Data. This is Brian T. O'Neill. Today, I have Ori Udalevich on the line. How are you, Ori? Hi, Brian. I'm doing great. Really looking forward to this episode. One of the things I love about like the data space and like the career that I chose to specialize in as a designer is like all these different domain spaces where there's just interesting things to get into around uh, data and insights. So you're chief product officer at Material Zone. So you're helping largely material scientists, bench scientists run experiments to figure out what are the better materials I can use in my products to get different parameters out of them, better performance, better longevity, whatever the qualities that they're looking for. Did, did I basically summarize Material Zone correctly there? That's perfect. I mean, we like to say that we accelerate innovation in, uh, in R&D for material scientists. Yeah, this is a digital software delivered through web web interface. It's really targeted at scientific users. Is that correct? Yeah, exactly. We're a SaaS platform completely on the cloud, browser based, and we're we're targeting researchers in the lab, helping them do their, their experiments faster. Got it. And just curious, like who buys this like at a company? Is it I'm assuming it's not the individual bench scientists or whatever that are buying this as like head of R and D or like what makes them feel like, oh, I have a need for something like this in the first place? Yeah, no, that's that's a really good question. So um, usually we we go through the head of R&D or head of innovation. Sometimes it's the CEO if it's a small company. So just somebody usually higher up that wants to improve efficiency, get into this whole AI business, uh, try to start using their data properly. Uh, sometimes it comes from below. So sometimes you'll have a researcher that will hear about us and then... Uh, you know, give us a call or talk to his boss and uh, right. get interested. Yeah, right. So during our screening call, you you correct me if I, I'm wrong here, but like I I think I told you it might be fun to like maybe use a real example. You don't have to obviously give us a client name or anything like that, but to pick a pick a real product or something, whether it's lipstick or battery, you know, home batteries or something like this. But my my understanding is like. In the old world, or maybe the world a lot of people are still living in, if you're, say, say you're, I don't know, you're Amazon or whatever, and you're trying to make a longer lasting battery than Duracell, and you want to sell it more cheaply or whatever, you might have your scientists trying to figure out, like, how can we change the chemistry of a battery so that we can get longer performance without overheating or whatever other, you know, parameters they're making, keeping the cost, that materials have to be cheap, et cetera. In the old way, you basically, like, played around in the kitchen in an actual wet lab and you're running experiments which are lengthy and costly and so the alternative is to use either digital twins or to have more insights about like you know hypothetically if you ran this combination of you know this kind of bread with this much water and this much flour and you substitute this kind of salt you might see these parameters in the future am i getting this mostly correct so far (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> yeah, no, that's that's perfect. And actually, that, I think that's the fascinating thing about material science is that you have all these variety of domains. So you mm-hmm. gave the example of batteries, and I think you mentioned lipstick, and uh, but all of these things. And even if you go to concrete or uh, plastic, they follow the same process, right? So they all, we like to say, resemble cooking, right? And you also gave right. the example of uh, baking bread and flour. So all of these are, are use cases. So, and I can mention a couple of them. So, for example, we work with companies that make consumer goods, right? So it can be shampoos or cosmetics. And uh, one of the problems that they face is that that they have to do very long uh, testing, lengthy testing of their products because they have to see, does the product go bad after it sits on the shelf for three, six, nine months? Mm. Right? And this is something you can use machine learning and, uh, and digital twin, as you mentioned, to shorten these times because you can sometimes predict after only one or two months that something's going to go wrong seven months later. Right. And uh, the example of the batteries you gave is perfect. Right. So sometimes you want to introduce a new technology. We have a project in the solid state battery uh, business, right, where you just want to really substitute the the very basic uh, components of your batteries with something which is maybe easier to get, 
or maybe cheaper, maybe more sustainable, and try to make good batteries, right? That last longer, that are more powerful. And all of these processes are, are pretty similar. It's an iterative process that takes typically a long time, it can take years even to develop such a product. And using your data in a smart way and using machine learning to predict what can happen and what's better to try out can really reduce cost and uh, accelerate time to market. Got it. What kind of change are you looking at? Is this something like if I'm making my new battery here, we're talking about what might take a year's worth of experiments and, you know, $10,000 per experiment. Maybe I run 25 of them and now you're doing it in a month or like, just give me an order of magnitude. Like what's the difference between doing this analog or whatever the old fashioned way was versus now? Yeah. So the difference can be really up to 70% uh, less experiments, which can mean 70% like shorter time and uh, 70% less resources that you're using. Maybe your researchers can do more projects in the same time. So it's really significant. The old way, uh, as you called it, that's what we call like trial and error, right? Where you, you're just trying out a lot of things. The human mind cannot process a large number of parameters at once. So typically what you'll do is you'll just choose one thing. For example, the temperature of the oven, right? If you're making maybe ceramic tiles, right? And then you'll just try, start playing only with that single parameter. So you'll just have like many, many experiments where you just try to optimize this one parameter and then you might have 20, 30 or 100 more. And uh, using machine learning, you can just do much. You can change a lot of parameters at once, and the model can really learn much faster what has the most effect, what has a positive effect, was it what has a negative effect. So, so the, the differences can be really huge. From a U UX standpoint, am I getting a prediction of what the parameters might be, and then I can decide: Do I want to actually go run it in the real world with those settings to see if it actually matches? Is is that kind of the way it works? Yeah, I mean, sort of. You will get a prediction. The problem with material science, what makes it very different from the data perspective from other fields, for example, if you're doing usage analytics, right, of a, of a website, right, you'll have hundreds of thousands, millions of data points, and you can get very accurate models. In material science, typically what you have is very few experiments because they're so costly, and you have a very large parameter space because you can try out, you know, thousands, tens of thousands of different materials and play around parameters. So the, the models are not extremely accurate, but the, the nice thing is that you can test everything, right? So you can test everything in the lab. So the model is more, it gives you a direction, which what you can try and what you shouldn't try. It will help you maybe explore spaces that you wouldn't even think of trying because in your intuition doesn't take you there. And as you go, the model, of course, becomes better, right? And it becomes better from project to project, right? So the in your 10th project, you're already, your model becomes stronger It'll give you more accurate predictions. So it's a combination of prediction and recommendation, right? Mm -hmm. Recommending what you should do in the lab. And is it only my company's data? Like, I don't get to learn from what Energizer did with when they tried putting water in the battery. Like, like is that <laughs> no, correct? It's all isolated? Or, or are you building, like, larger models? It's like, we know a lot about sand or silica and how that our models know something about silica when that's an ingredient. Like, how does that work? Yeah, that, no, that's a great question. We don't share data or even learnings that we have from different companies because that's that's not allowed. I mean, yeah, we, have two we have two competitors <laughs> that work for us. One, one doesn't want the other to, to learn from their experience. So part of it is your own data, right? So your own data stays with you, but then there's also the public data. So it's a bit like how ChatGPT works, right? I mean, we, we want to believe uh, OpenAI that they're not using our data. If we have the pro account... Uh, to train their models, but the model is trained on a lot of public data, right? And then our data kind of is added for our specific use. And that's more or less what happens in our case. So we have data, which is public. You know, there's a lot of knowledge on raw materials, what are their properties, different chemicals, there's scientific data out there, right? Experiments that are made public through scientific articles. So those can be used in the model, plus the data of the of the company. And of course, our technology builds upon all this knowledge, right? So uh, the data itself we don't use, but the, the algorithms become better. So part of what I wanted to talk about is like, how does one go about designing an experience here for these kinds of users? And I, the, the first thing that came to mind is some clients I've worked with in these kinds of capacities, the engineering mindset and the technical mindset, if I'm working with a technical stakeholder, is like, we can do it for lipsticks, so we can do it for batteries. 
And the assumption is like, basically experiments are all the same thing. You can just swap out the nouns and it's the same thing. And the designer in me is going, yeah, until you actually go out and talk to a battery scientist and or pick something where there's like heavy regulation or so, well, like you can't even get access to that material, let alone run an experiment on it without going through like 25 tiers of like government policy, regulate, blah, blah, blah. It's not the same. Or is it? So maybe you could tell me a little bit about like, do you have to onboard a new domain? Like now we're going to go into liquids or now we're going to go into gases, like, you know, products that involve gases or do you have to kind of like bring on a new domain space and are the scientists working the same way? And how do your designers or product team account for these differences or are there not differences? No, no, <laughs> definitely. There are differences. So in the ideal world or in the naive world, maybe the world we were in a few years ago, <laughs> we thought, you know, everything is the same, right? right. Everything <laughs> is like cooking. I mean, that's what, that's what I might say in a, in a podcast. Right. Then when you actually go and work in a, on a, on a use case with a client, then you re, you see the differences. There's a lot of differences and there's a lot of commonality as well. So as I said, the core is pretty much the same, right? You're doing experiments, you're trying out different formulations, different pro what we call processing parameters, right? Like the temperature and pressure, et cetera. But, you know, the devil is in the detail. So once you go deeper into a use case, you see that there is a lot of differences. And we do, we do try to specialize in domains, right? So we have a few domains that we're more specialized in. We're open to trying out new domains, but there are some domains that we're just better at just because we have the experience. And I'll give you know a few examples of what they could differ in. So first of all, you know these are scientific domains. Each one of them is a is a full science. You know there's uh, people writing PhDs on on each one of them. So the data itself, for example, the types of raw materials people use is different. The data structure is different. The quantity of data differs quite a lot, right? When you do ex like experiments with batteries, you have lots of data because batteries you. You, can, you have these uh, machines, they're called cyclers, where you, you put on shelves hundreds of batteries and you test them all at once, right? You charge, discharge them for, for a long time, and then you gather lots and lots of data. Whereas where you, you do um, something, in the, for example, in the domain of ceramics, you, can't, you don't try so many. You, you just can't. Uh, it's much slower. You can't do so many in parallel. You have much less data. That's one difference. And then, and then your models are different. Your data structure is different complexity of data can vary tools that you're using like analytic tools really scientific equations that you use so we we have them embedded in our system where you can actually do very specific calculations or analyze certain graphs those are diff very different from one domain to another so yeah there's quite a lot of difference but there's also quite a lot of commonality because you're you're storing the data we have a, a data structure which is uh, common right so the interface the, the UI is the same for everyone. In the end, you have each domain, you have some raw materials, you have some formulations, you have some tests that you're doing, you have different statistical plots that are very common. So yeah, so the overall experience is, is very similar. But then when you go into the details, we really have kind of a, a special domain or a special environment that is a bit different for each. Uh, oh, so it does the experience or the interface is different based on the domain that you're working in to a degree? Yeah, not the UI itself. So the UI uh -huh. looks the same. What I meant is that the the kind of the workspace you're in is different, right? So you'll have maybe the language will be different, right? In batteries, you'll have kind of an area where you'll, you'll collect your anodes and your cathodes and your electrolytes. Whereas when you work in ceramics, you'll have uh, an area where you collect the different ovens you're using. And uh, so it, it looks different. But mm -hmm. let's make it customizable uh, per domain. You told me that like you you've had some stumblings over the years. You've been there about five years at Material Zone. Is that right? And felt like you had kind of landed at a fairly mature product and design uh, user experience process there. Tell me about the before and after, like in your version of whatever mature means. Or and, and I think that's something where it doesn't need to be measured externally. It can just be measured internally. Like I feel like we're making good progress, or we're repeatedly shipping value out the door. What was it like before? What's changed over the five years about how your teams are working together to, to make this product? Yeah, I know. So the, the change is huge. I mean, when I when I arrived, it wasn't that mature yet. I mean, we had some some good processes in, but we were very small. First of all, uh, we were a team of about five people, five technical people. 
Some of them were abroad. There was very little communication between us. You know, we had sort of like a kind of a Jira, Jira-like uh, process, but we didn't have like good product techniques, right? We weren't doing experiments with users. We weren't listening enough to our users, following a lot of, uh, of intuition, being very sales-driven, right? So every opportunity kind of takes you in a different direction. So, you know, I think the, the things that a lot of early, early stage companies suffer from, as we grew, we went through a financing round, hired some more people, and we started growing in the product sense. We actually, I think when I arrived, we didn't even have the notion of product, right? It was more like the management level was telling the developer directly what to do, you know, and then we, we just went and learned. We went and talked to some external consultants. We read some books. We tried out, out, out some things. And today we, we have, I think, a much more mature process. We do a lot of experiments. Our experiments are, some companies have experiments that are very short. You can just try like 10 different things a week. We, we can't do that typically. Some, you know, some UI things we can, but a lot of our experiments, because the actual use cases take a long time, then what we'll typically do is we'll do what we call the Wizard of Oz technique, right? Where you, you kind of simulate as if you have a feature, but you're actually working for your client behind the scenes. Uh, of course, telling them that that's what you're doing, but then measuring the value, understanding if there's any point in, in, in developing a, a feature of doing that. And then while, you know, once, once you validate it and you have enough data and you also know where the feature goes, is going to, then you'll, uh, you'll start designing it and releasing it in very, you know, incremental stages. Yeah, so so I think we you know we've made we've made a, a lot of progress in in how we discover opportunities and how we build something iteratively in an agile way, and you know making sure that we're always kind of going in the right direction. Can you unpack for people that don't know what that Wizard of Oz technique is? Can you use a real example or a realistic example of one of these experiments that you've done, just so someone can see it in their head? Yeah, sure. So, you know, I mentioned this uh, machine learning technique, right, where we create a model of the client's data and then we start recommending experiments, right? So initially, like we didn't have this feature available and we just had data scientists sitting in the background running scripts. And then we had a customer success guy talking to the client and pretending as if, you know, he is the UI, right? So the customer would send him uh, the data he would measure the guy in the background would run the machine learning models, send it back to the customer success representative who would then recommend the experiments to the client of, you know, doing everything we can via the UI. So, for example, just manually inserting the, date, the recommendations. So creating this kind of iterative cycle as if the client is actually just doing it via our UI. And then, you know, once we understood, for example, what the problems are, what kind of information we need from the client, what they understand better, what is dif more difficult for them to understand, then we could really come up with a design that, you know, that is based on actual work of a user and not our guess as how to that user will want to use such a feature. And then we started building it and building it, you know, in stages. So in the first stage, the user, you know, can still not configure it on his own, but he can already use it, right? So we'll configure it for him in the background and then he'll start using it. And then after we, we see that it works, then we'll start adding more customization options for the user and so forth as, as you know, as the feature grows. That's what I would call like a Wizard of Oz technique. It almost sounds like there's a level of like consulting services going on and then you're eventually productizing that over time once you see the re repeatability of it, consistent feedback. Is that essentially what was happening? Yeah, for sure, for sure. The early stages, uh, there's there's a lot of service. There's a lot of help from us. Mm -hmm. uh, we meet the clients on a regular basis in the initial stages, you know, and the more we progressed, the more we could kind of let them go faster. But in initially, yeah, it was like, it was, I would say, a very lar large chunk of services. Right. Uh, consulting and, you know, and, and, and eventually you want to build a product that, that can just grow on its own. Right, right. How does the user experience piece uh, fit into this? Like, when do your designers get involved with that? And like, is this a fairly complex experience for somebody, especially if they haven't had access to these kinds of tools before, how do they get involved and where do they fit in with this kind of product discovery iteration process? So you're referring to the to designers, you said, right? Yeah. Mm -hmm. 
Okay, so that's that's another thing we learned and progressed with uh, quite a bit with the years. So we learned that the designers have to be involved in a project, in an idea from the very beginning, yeah. right? So already at the stage of the Wizard of Oz, we'll just you know get them involved in the idea, right? There, there's still no UI, but they'll start learning what the process, what, what are the users going through? Maybe we'll record a call with a user and they'll watch it and we'll start making mock-ups. Mock-ups where we can really show the user some interfaces because, you know, when you, when you have a mock-up, when you have something visual you can look at, you can have a much deeper discussion over, you know, is this good? Is this not good? So the designers will be involved already from at that stage, right? And at that stage, we'll start making some mock-ups, start, start running ideas, having internal discussions, and having maybe some user testing of these mock-ups, showing the users uh, some pictures, getting their, their opinion, starting to mm-hmm. see, you know, do you even understand what this thing means? And then they'll, they'll be involved throughout the process. They'll work very closely with our product team. They'll work very closely with the developers. And sometimes they'll even uh, join, you know, a call or two with a, with a user mm-hmm. just to get like kind of the firsthand uh, experience. So right at the beginning of this response you just gave me, you said something like, we figured out that they need to be there from the beginning. That sounds like it wasn't like that in the past. And then it became like that at some point. What happened there? What made you feel like, oh, this is better when they're involved from the start? Yeah, they were definitely not not there from the start. So, Mm -hmm. you know, in the start, we actually didn't really have so much of (laughs) so many designers. And we had somebody somebody internal who was just really good at designing stuff uh, who would make mockups. Yeah. You know, and then we we hired a designer externally, so somebody that would work a few hours with us a month. So we couldn't get them involved as much. And I mean, there's another problem which is inherent in our domain, which is the the as you said, it's the technicality of the problem, right? So it's not like you can bring a designer in, you know, sit with them an hour or two, show them the platform and they'll get it, right? Uh, it's very technical, you know, very scientific in nature, and you really have to get somebody to be there for half a year, a year before you really see that they're they're starting to to understand. So it, yeah, so it wasn't like the in- instinctive thing to get the designers involved. Sure. You would sit there and not understand, mm-hmm. you know. And as as we learned, we also saw, and I think this is kind of goes all around, not only about designers, that you really want to get people to see things firsthand, right? Mm-hmm. Some you want to get developers to even watch a call with a user sometimes, uh, you know, even if they don't interact uh, on a daily basis with a user. When they see somebody using the platform, there's nothing like that, right? There's mm-hmm. nothing. Uh, I mean, I can show the developer, oh, look, I, I saw a user do this. It's not the same thing when they just see somebody do it. Firsthand, and, yeah. Uh, I yeah, completely that, agree. Yeah. yeah. What got you to the point, though, that you felt like involving them early was important to do as opposed to just keeping it the way it was? Yeah. I think just the inefficiency of it. Right, just the the number of iterations we would have to go through until we got something good, right? And sometimes you would just say, you know, if they were just there in that meeting, right? Yeah, I wouldn't need to explain that. And they were they were also asking for it. They wanted to be more involved, right? And you and you want to avoid having calls with 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 customers where you have like ten people there, right? So you have to be, but but you know, you can sample it. You can bring a, a designer there once a month, for example, or, or show them a recording. Uh, yeah, so it was really just the the efficiency and the, and the quality as well, because they would just get it much more. They would get the problem. They would uh, they would be much more creative with their solutions, and they would get much more engaged. They'd be more motivated. How is that changing to now? In terms of like, it sounds like you have a fairly mature set of designers on on the team or something like this. But how has the product evolved to this the point where it is now? Are there still challenges? Is it, is it like bringing on a new domain, a new scientific domain that's difficult? What's hard about the product and, and how has that changed over time about using the product, I should say? Yeah. The main problem that we, we're encountering is change management, right? Like changing this, the mindset of users, right? Getting, I mean, we, we go into a company and the time it takes to get users engaged, to get users to want to do this, each domain is very, very different. And our users are not people that sit in front of a computer. These are researchers that work in the lab. They have gloves on. They can't really use the computer all day, right? So it's very different if you cater to 
don't know, to developers or product managers. If you're building a tool like that, then you know, you know, your users are are computer geeks in a way, right? And our users are not. They look at their phone once in a while, but they're not behind their computers. And the main challenge is getting people to use the platform more, to want to be there, to see, you know, it's worth it for me to go there maybe once an hour or even twice a day and put in my data, look, look at some insights, run the machine learning models. We're always looking for ways to make that transition faster. And yeah, and I think for us, that's probably, you know, one of the main challenges. Uh, and, and I think the key is really user experience, making it just fun and easy and intuitive to use this platform. Because that, that's, you know, if, if you ask me what we do, then we make, I mean, we, we accelerate innovation. That was the, <laughs> the introduction. But we also make data science uh, accessible to non-technical people, to chemists and mm-hmm. uh, material scientists. And that's not easy. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, no, I understand that. The low adoption problem is it's in a lot of places. It sounds like it's in material science as well here and you you do have this extra challenge of like their work environment is not necessarily in front of a screen all the time. So, how do you incentivize them to want to I, I'm guessing maybe they're running experiments and every week they need to log some data back into the tool so that it can learn something about whether it worked and make the models better. Is this something where they're kind of like, yeah, I get paid the same whether I do that or not. Like maybe this battery will be better. I'll just run another experiment because that's what I do. I run experiments. Is that the mindset a little bit there? Or is it more that it's difficult where it's challenging to go, I got to like read the numbers off of this like physical oven that my ceramics are in and then type them in to your interface. I don't really get anything immediately out of that. Is it more that it's hard or annoying or is it more that like they're just apathy? Yeah, I think there's the hard and annoying part, which we try to make that experience smoother. But even mm-hmm. even if you make it extremely smooth, if they don't see what they get out of it, as you said, they're still not going to want to do that, right? Because mm-hmm. even if something is very easy, you're not going to do it if, if it's, you're just doing it for the sake of doing it. We also went through a lot of, of that, like trying out different features that we thought, oh, this is awesome. They're going to want to see these really cool plots, right? And, you know, often that that's not enough. Yeah. What we find is that if this can really make them work faster or, you know, develop better products, that gets them interested, right? Because, Mm -hmm. you know, there's this kind of saying today about uh, chat GPT and all all that, that if you're, you know, there's going to be the people that are using it and the people that are not using it and the people using it are going to be going to win, right? They're going to be the ones staying. Chat GPT is not going to replace us. But the people using it will replace the people not using it just because they're they're working faster, right? Uh, of course, this is a, a bit of a cliche, and uh, we're in the middle of a hype, right? But but in the end, I think it's true. Like if you if you're adopting these uh, advanced tools, you're you're in the end, it makes you a better researcher, a better worker. And I think we really see differences within a team. You can see some people are better at adopting it. And, and they grow faster and they become leaders in their team and they slowly uh, drag the others, the others in. Mm-hmm. Is this because like the buyer is the head of R&D and they, they see like the potential value in reducing expensive experiments in the, in the lab, et cetera. But the lab scientists are like, what's in it for me? <laughs> is, yeah, is it like that? Or they're not, there's not a lot of incentive for, for them to necessarily on their individual level projects or products it's not there's not as much incentive is that is that the challenge yeah that that's a challenge but also i mean that usually doesn't work like when the when the boss comes and says okay you have to use it that that's not strong enough yeah but you you really see within a team right the people at the, the, the let's say lower level that are doing the actual work you see people that just adopt it really fast they just look at it and there's like oh cool i want to use this and with them it's it's super easy it's a, it's so fun to just work with them and, and see them uh get it and enjoy it. And then you, you'll see people that are kind of like, no, I'm, you know, I'm happy with the way I'm working now. I don't want to be bothered with learning a new tool or you just kind of need to find the ones that are easier to attract, create momentum there, and they will slowly bring in the others, right? Because the others will see them uh, working. And, and, and that's the, so yeah, so I think it's not enough to go only at the higher level and expect that the bosses are going to get it in because the bosses, they have a lot of stuff to do, right? They're not going to be there making sure that people are ticking in measurements and 
Yeah. So you, yeah, you, yeah. you have to get the, the actual people on the ground interested and 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 engaged and, and working. Yeah. It was one of the things that I didn't learn till much older later in my career was that this, especially with design and, and these adoption challenges, is there has to be a real incentive for the worker, even if the the product in theory, like if you were to explain this to someone, it's like, of course, why would you not want to do it this way? It's It sounds totally obvious. But then you have to think about the user experience outcome piece, which is what's in it for the individual scientist. It's got to be way better than something they're doing today. It's got to take away some kind of pain or something they don't like doing. It's got to increase their status somehow, whether it's they're getting promoted or it's like everybody wants to work with this scientist because they're just cranking out winners all day long. And then they find out, oh, it's because I I'm doing 10 times less experiments than you are. I'm not guessing like I'm using this product. But if we're not dialed into like at that, you know, at that line level, the person who's actually hands on computer or hands on the interface, if we don't know what it's like to be that person, it's really hard because you just have this theoretical value. You have this tool that theoretically should be really obvious. And of course, they'd want to use it, but they're not the ones paying for it. There's always those two sides of the coin to me. And if they're not using it, eventually that's going to get back to the buyer, which is we're paying all this money and no one's using this tool. We're not getting any value out of it, right? Do you see it that way as well? Or? Definitely. It's very, it's very, very tough to also, I think uh, some of our most valuable employees are the people who are the users or who could have been users. Our product manager today is a material scientist. And we have a team of material scientists, and and these people are really the ones that they can, they kind of imagine. So I'm not a material scientist myself, right? So for me, it's it's harder to imagine being that person in the lab, right? And sometimes, kind of the, what I think is correct just turns out to be completely wrong because, you know, I just don't know what what it's like. And I think having these people within your product team and within your customer success team, and even even within your development team, we also have material scientists in the development team, people that made the transition to, to software and data science, you can't replace that. And of course, you can't replace talking to the users and to potential customers all the time. And, and yeah, it's really a, this search for the product market fit. That's a, that's a very tough search, you know, finding because you, you start with, a, with an idea, but then when you actually get it, you know, start building it, you, you realize that half your idea doesn't really work or is not really valuable and, and you have to keep refining it. And, uh, and we, we see that very, very strongly. Yeah. Yeah. Or it's been a, a great chat. Do you have any like closing thoughts, pr- particularly any, any advice you might give yourself of five years less age, you know, <laughs> or, or, or someone in your space here, something you've changed about how you're doing product, how you're leading product about how you're doing, working with design, anything like that you might want to share with our audience. Yeah, sure. I mean, I think we kind of said a lot of it. Listening to your user. Don't don't think you know better, right? Don't come and say, you know, I I know the answer. Let's just follow, mm-hmm. you know, what I think or what my boss thinks. Just be very uh, modest and just listen to your users. Listen to your customers. You know, look at your competition, what they're doing. Look outside and see what you can learn, and and always keep learning, right? Always keep learning because. There's always ways to, you know, keep learning from the from the outside. Don't mm-hmm. don't say, okay, now I know, now I'll go and build, right? And right. I think I think that, you know, agile is kind of uh, based on that, and I think that's that's so true, right? And there's a lot of content in that, right? A lot of things, uh, details to learn of how how to do that, and I'm I'm still learning all the time, but I think that's a big thing, yeah. Cool, Ori, thank you so much. Uh, Ori is the chief product officer at Material Zone. Um, can people get in touch with you somewhere, LinkedIn? Are you on social media, anything like that? Sure, I'm, uh, I'm on LinkedIn. You can email me, ori at materials.zone. Very easy to, to access. My, na- my name is very unique, Ori Udelevich. Uh, you won't find an- another one. Nice, nice. <laughs> find my LinkedIn account. I didn't even know there was a dot .zone top-level domain. That's uh, <laughs> You guys got that one lucky. So. <laughs> Excellent. Well, Ori, it was really nice uh, to talk to you, and uh, thanks for coming on Experiencing Data. Thank you, Brian. We hope you enjoyed this episode of Experiencing Data with Brian O'Neill. If you did enjoy it, please consider sharing it with the hashtag Experiencing Data. 
To get future podcast updates or to subscribe to Brian's mailing list, where he shares his insights on designing valuable enterprise data products and applications, visit designingforanalytics.com slash podcast.